out a Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We are uh, continuing our series on uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Something that is what is Jesus' longest teaching that's recorded in Scripture. And uh, it, is got, it has so many wonderful things. It could take a year to go through it. We're just stopping at a few points and highlighting a few things throughout the summer, looking at this uh, great passage of Scripture and saying, what does it mean to us? What, what, can it, what can we learn that can draw us closer to God and closer to each other? So, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at that in just a moment. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one in the pew rack in front of you, and uh, I would challenge you to go ahead and take it out. Uh, we like people to follow along as we talk about the scripture to make sure, uh, you know, we're not making this stuff up. It's right there. And we have provided that in the pew rack in front of you. I'll be reading from that version uh, that's in your pew rack. As well as uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, if that's why you don't have one with you because you don't own a Bible, please take that one home. We want uh, every family to have a copy of God's Word in their household. So uh, that's our gift to you as well today. So Matthew chapter 6, and uh, we're going to be looking that, at that in just a, a moment. I want to, uh, there's, there's a place on the back of your bulletin if you want to follow along, take some notes. But basically, again, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, to give you a, just a brief review, it was Pastor Daniel who said a few weeks back that it's the masterpiece of cultural and religious teaching. And, and that is exactly what it is. There's so much there. It's so rich. It's so deep. And uh, part of that understanding and part of that appreciation comes from knowing the context. The context is basically Jesus is on a hillside on the Sea of Galilee. And on that hillside, uh, he called his disciples. He went up the hill. There's a huge group of people there. But he goes up the hill and uh, calls his disciples to himself. And so the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is to the disciples. That's important for us to realize because although the crowd then followed the disciples up and most of the crowd were able to hear Jesus because of the, you know, he's on a hillside and it's the lake behind him and great acoustics. So they were listening as well. But the Sermon on the Mount is for the followers of Jesus. And guess what we are? Followers of Jesus. And so, what is Jesus saying to us? These are words to us, not just to the whole crowd, but to his disciples, and that's us. So, quick review. We've, we've covered a bunch out of, the, uh, out, out of this uh, so far. The Chapter 5 is when he started. And he starts with the Beatitudes, which is a list of... Uh, it's, it's, it, we read it sometimes like a Christian wish, wish list of, wow, blessed are the merciful and they'll receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in spirit because they'll, uh, you know, see the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who search, uh, thirst for righteousness because they'll be satisfied. You know, and we read it and we go, wow, I wish we could measure up that. It is a description of the citizen of the kingdom. And that's important for us to realize too. That it is... God's description of what it should be like. Jesus is saying, this is what disciples of mine look like. Granted, we're not all there. We're all a work in progress. We're all on that journey. But that is what we're striving for. To be merciful people. To be people who are humble. To be people who are thirsting for righteousness. Who are reaching for God. Who want to know God. So that's the Beatitudes. And then we talked about how Jesus said, and you're salt and light in this world. And to be salt and light in the world means that we as a church cannot fulfill our mission unless we are in the world. The church is not a place to where we can escape, where we, where we hide out from the world around us, the big, mean world that's out there. And so we gather here together and, and give each other comfort we are called to be in the world. Jesus made that very clear. Unfortunately, most churches spend time, the majority of their time, and most of their resources, ministering to those that are inside the church, as opposed to those who are outside. The most important thing that happens in the church happens where? outside these walls. We try to emphasize that here at Parkwood. It's not what happens here, it's what happens out there. It is what each of us as individual members of the body of Christ are doing and living and saying and breathing and our attitudes 
outside the church while we're in the world. That's what changes the world. That's what changes the world. What happens in here can change us, and, and, and therefore we can change the world. But I want you to know that the goal is not what happens in here. The goal is what happens out there. Are, are we being faithful to that? I hope that we are. I hope we're striving to become more and more that way. Like I said, most churches, maybe even I could say all churches, spend most of their time ministering to people inside. And there's nothing wrong with ministering to people inside, but when that's all you do, we're in trouble. So, and uh, we talked about how Jesus talked about fulfilling the law in chapter 5. As he goes through the end of that chapter, he talks about, you've heard it said, don't, don't kill and don't uh, commit adultery and do this and that. And he, he'd say, but I say, and he'd go deeper. And that was important for us to realize that it was the spirit of the law Jesus was trying to say. I didn't come to destroy the law. I've come to show you what the law is really about. And that is, it's not just about not killing people. It's about loving people, not hating them, not wanting to kill them. Not just not killing them, but not even wanting to do that. A world that doesn't have that is a world filled with hate. Does that sound familiar? Hate and violence. So uh, w w th then he goes into the first part of chapter 6, the, the Lord's Prayer. And that brings us up to speed. And he says, this is how you ought to pray. And he's just talked about how we are in need of getting in line with what God feels about this world and how God feels about us and our mission. And so prayer, he gives the Lord's Prayer. And if you notice that the Lord's Prayer is different than the way we pray because it is all about getting in line with God, not God getting in line with us. That's how most of us pray. Hey, God, this is what I'm going to do. Can you, get, can you get with the program here? Can you give me a little boost here, Lord? Can you give me a little extra? Can you help me be successful today in what I've got planned? Instead of, God, what do you got planned? Now, that's the way most of us pray. But Jesus said, when you pray, you pray this way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. You know, I'm depending on you. Please give me my daily bread. Please forgive me of my sins. And, and please protect me. And don't lead me into that. It's all about getting in line with God. So that's, that, that brings us up to today. So um, we'll try to, try to get uh, this next piece, which is in chapter 6. And I want to just read a few verses out of starting in verse 19 through 24. And uh, let's, just, let's just read this, and then we were going to break this apart and say, what is it then that God wants us to do after we get this lesson? Because this is given in an order for us to, to learn. So, verse 19, I'm going to start. If you don't have your Bible open, look up at the screen. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye of the lamp, of, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for he will, either, he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just pray that as we open this word, as we look and, and sparse out these, these words that you spoke 2,000 years ago, we pray that you'd bring them to life, that you would breathe once again into these words. For you, Lord, we know are alive and living, and therefore we can hear your voice speak these words to us again, just as you did on that hillside. Let all other voices fade to the background. And Father, may we make a decision today that will draw us closer to you, closer to each other, and make us more of what you intended us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen.
So today, uh, I've titled this message, Divided Loyalties. And what I want us to look at, and it's pretty obvious, I think, in the scripture, but I want to just get into it enough that helps us to go through from this place with some practical decision-making that can help us draw closer to the Lord. So, one thing is, this, is a, this, is, this passage is about deciding who to follow. You know, we live in a world where indecision is rampant. You know, uh, either we can't decide or we don't decide right now. We put off a decision, which in a way is a decision. We know that how that happens. But indecision is not a good thing. We need to be able to be decisive, and especially when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. There's some problems with indecision that I'd like to point out today. Problems with uh, being divided and, and uh I, I would say from the scripture, and, and you can jot these down, I'm just going to give you three problems with it that you can jot down in just the scripture references. First of all, uh, uh, when, when we are indecided, when we cannot decide to fully follow the Lord and who we will follow, it invites us to failure. Jesus said this in, in Matthew 22, uh, I think it's 22, it may be 12, but I think it's 22. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Remember that? Remember that when Jesus said that? Okay, well, that's truth. If your heart is divided, you're going to fall apart. You're, you're, it's it's going to be disastrous for you. It, it, it keeps us down. It, it allows us to miss what God might have for us because we're undecided. Another thing about indecision is it hinders our prayers. In James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed in the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Yikes. You see, sometimes we say, well, why, why are my prayers unanswered? Do you believe God answering your prayers? Do you believe God hears you? Do you believe, do you trust in the Lord? Some of us, we ask, but we don't have any, we don't have any idea that God might or could answer our prayers. So it hinders our prayers. The third thing is it hinders our readiness to serve. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and, throw, to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards Him. You have done foolishly in this. For, from now on you will have wars. The word for blameless is those who are wholeheartedly His. 100%. You know that's what God looks for? He looks for somebody who loves Him. Totally. Now, if you don't believe that, let me just remind you what the greatest commandment is. Because in the greatest commandment, Jesus, Jesus said this. He, they, they asked him, they said, hey, Jesus, you, you know, you're Mr. Jesus. You claim to be the Son of God. You know, what's the greatest commandment? Greatest commandment. And uh, you might remember what it is, but we just have it up here. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. I want to emphasize today that it's not just love God, but it's love God with the little word there that applies to what I'm talking about today is all. You see how many times it's in there? You shall love the, God, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Everything. This is the greatest commandment. It's not just, hey, I really like God. I love pizza. I love God. I love my dog. I love God. No. Do you love Him with everything in you? Your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And God, he says, that's the greatest commandment. That's the greatest commandment. It's a it's a hundred percent. Jesus made it very clear. This is the most important part of your relationship with God. This is righteousness. He even goes on to say that anybody who keeps this commandment will keep all other commandments. 
You don't even have to worry about the other commandments if you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The hymn writer said, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all. Wow. That is what we're talking about today. An undivided heart. Undivided loyalties. And so, I, I, it comes, brings me to this. That there's basically three questions that you need to ask yourself. That Jesus gives right here in this passage. In the Sermon on the Mount. You say, boy, you're really getting away from... No, no, let's look at it. Starting with verse 19. Jesus gives a few things. And they're all related to... The, all these verses are related. Giving us three things to check off. First thing is, okay, the question to ask is, where's your heart? Where is your heart? What do you love? What do you desire? What do you invest your life in? Because let me tell you something, whatever you love, that's what you're gonna put that's where you're gonna put your money. You know, if you love the Redskins, I could tell by coming to your house. You know, or the bumper stickers on your car, or the posters in your, you know, you can tell. You walk into somebody's house, you say, oh, you're a such and such fan. Or, oh, I see that you like the beach. How do you know those things? Because they invest in the things that they love. And it becomes obvious, whatever people are invested in, that they love it. Jesus says, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. This is something Jesus already knew. So he says to us, he gives us that warning. Remember, he's talking to the disciples. Don't invest in the things of this world. Don't fall in love with the things of this world where moth can destroy and rust can destroy or thieves can steal it from you. But invest in the things that are eternal. Invest in the kingdom. Invest in me. He's saying, invest in the things that are eternal. Because where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. He's telling us, where is your heart? That gives us a great... If, if you're living for, for cars and houses and clothes and things like that, Jesus is saying, okay, that's where your heart is. But if you want to be... I want you to 100% love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. So that's the first question. Where's your heart? What are you invested in? Hey, it doesn't just get out of pen and paper. Where, where, do you, uh, where are your resources? Your time, your talents, your money. You know, I thought, I thought about this. That every single one of us, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, one of the things that we should continue to strive for is how can I give more of my resources to the kingdom of God and His work? How can I rearrange my budget? How can I do the things in my life that can free up more of my resources, time, as well as money and other things, to invest in the kingdom of God and the work of His kingdom? We should always be thinking about that. I, I thought about in the, in the fellowship hall today, we have a, a table, it's our script program. It's a missions program, it's called Script. It's, it's basically gift cards which all of us buy. All of us buy great gift cards. We go to Giant, we go to Safeway, wherever you get your gift cards, you go and you buy them. And you pay $50, you get a $50 gift card. Okay? Well, we have gift cards here that same price, same thing, but a percentage of it goes to missions. These, these retailers and merchandise, they said if you do it through the church, we'll give a percentage of it to missions. You know what? So if I buy my gift cards here at the fellowship hall, a percentage of that goes to missions and God's kingdom work. Yep. Well, where are you going to buy your gift cards? Well, Giant's more convenient. I, you know, it's, uh, oh, really? You see, where's your heart? I should be figuring this out. Anyway, okay, so the other question, where's your heart? Then Jesus says, now, and, he, and he, this is a little bit more cryptic, and we read it and we go, what? The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. What do you have your eye on? What do you have your eye on? 
Jesus is referring to what we look at, what we long for. He's, he's not talking about just what you love, where your heart is. He's talking about what are you, what's your goals? What, do you, what are the things that you look for? You know, for, for some in the world, they look for pleasures of life. They look for money and power. They look for opportunities to step up the ladder. What is in your eye? And Jesus says, if there's light, if you're looking towards the light, if you're looking for God, if, if the things of the kingdom are, 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 are your goal and what you have your eye on, then you'll be full of light. But if, you're, if, the, if it's not the kingdom, if it's something of this world, if it's other things, whether it be sins or lusts or other things that you want, then you're full of darkness. It affects you. I need you to be 100%. And you can't do that when your eye is on the things of this world. So what's your heart on? Or where is your heart? What do you have your eye on? And then who's your Lord? Jesus says, okay, let me just cut to the quick here. You can't serve two masters. You just can't. First of all, you're going to go crazy trying to serve two people. And, and your, your, your loyalties are going to be split and divided. Next thing you know, you're going to hate one, love the other, love one, hate the other, and you are just going to be a mess. You can't do it. You can't serve two masters. So the question is, who is your Lord? Who do you serve? Who do you answer to? Well, <laughs> I'm, I live in the United States of America. I answer to me. That's, that's the big thing. I answer to me and me alone. I'm my own boss. You're not the boss of me. You know, don't try to be the boss of me. I'm my own boss. Pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Area. Not only is that not biblical, that is not how we serve the Lord. We serve Him. We are dependent on God. We choose to surrender to Him and go to, at His bidding. Lord, we live to please You. Who are you living to please? I'm living to please my husband or my wife or I'm living to please my boss or I'm living to please myself. All wrong answers. None of them bad. But the number one person we're trying to please is God. It's God. He's our Lord. You can only serve one Lord. Which Lord are you going to serve? And who you serve determines your first two questions. Where's your heart? And what's your eye on? Because if I serve the Lord, my heart is fully His. And my eye is on the prize that Paul talks about in heaven. You see? So who do you serve? So we've got to make a decision. We've got to make a decision today because divided loyalties, that's a wreck. Everybody got that? Everybody agree? If you don't, wow. Did you take a nap? We gotta, we, this is... This is right here in the scripture. If you have a divided heart, divided loyalties, undecided, not good. Not good. So we got to decide. Well, here's how we make a decision. You ready? I'm going to give you four statements that you can put down and you can pray them if you'd like. But these are just helpful. They're not all inclusive. There's other things we got to daily talk about the, with the Lord. You know, and I'm not talking about getting saved again. I'm talking about every morning when you wake up, you decide who you're going to serve. Because we're, we're, when we give our hearts to the Lord, and maybe some of you haven't even done that, when you give your heart to the Lord, you do that one time and one time only, but then you do it every day you get up and you decide who's going to be your Lord. Are you going to obey him? You ready? Here it is. Four things real quick. You ready? The first one. I'm deciding today, and I wanted to make sure you knew that today is the day of salvation. It is the day to decide. I am deciding today that I will trust God and his word. We're going to track each one of these points. I'm going to give you an example out of the Old Testament so you know we're going to sew it together. You know how we love to do Old Testament and New Testament here to, make you, to, to help us to realize that the God is of the Old Testament and New Testament same, same, same God. Same God of love and mercy. All right? So, here we are. First, first decision you've got to make. I'm deciding today that I will trust God and His Word. In other words, you'll trust what He says. Well, that goes back to the very beginning. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say? Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God say that? How many of you do that with Bible verses? You know, you know something that's in God's word and you know you should love your enemies. Well, did God really mean love your enemies? Or did he really mean, you know, if they're in a car and you can't really see their face, you don't have to love them? <laughs> you know, where's the line there? No, he, he said it. And you've got to believe it. Temptation from the very beginning is to doubt God's word. That's the very first thing you've got to decide. Do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe in the words that come out of the, the Bible? Do you, do you take them? Do you, do you love them? Do you hold them dear? And do you trust them? Do you trust the God who accepts them? You got to decide that. Well, I don't know. I'm still out. You know, jury's still out on the uh, Bible thing. If it's really the Word of God, okay, we got a problem. The Bible is the Word of God. Okay. There's different different things you can get out of it, and different ways that people can read it and look at it and study it. But I'm telling you that this is the source of how we should live our lives. Okay. So, there's that one. All right, you must read it, you must believe it, you must act upon it. Now, the second uh, decision you have to make today is, I'm deciding today that I will trust God and not my past ways. Okay? You know, when things start to go bad, you always go back to what, you know, oh man, I'm going back to, you know, because when I was doing this, I wasn't having these problems and... So you, you go back and people who have extra problems that have addictions and things like that, when things start to go south, they go back to the addiction. They go back to the, to the pain. They go back to that which didn't necessarily work. But they do it. In Joshua, that's what he said to the people of Israel as they stood on the edge of the promised land. He said, now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day who you will serve. Make a choice. Decide whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're going to, you'll dwell. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Joshua is saying you've got to make a decision to cut with the past, the things that don't work, the things that you've invested in your life. And you said, I've tried all this thing. We come to a point in our lives where you say, I can't make it without God. And when you can't make it without God, you have to repent and say, everything that I've done, all the gods that I've served in the past have not come to fruition. They have not helped me. I've been in trouble my whole time, my life. I'm a mess without you, God. I need God. And so you get the past away. You say, I'm... Turning from the past. That's what repentance means. Repentance means I do a U-turn. I turn my back on the things that didn't work and I go with the things that the promises of God and I trust Him. Now, that's really harder than it sounds. But we got to do it. We got to decide today. The third thing is we got to decide today that we will trust in God for He is the one and only true God. He's the only one and true God. You say, well, I, b I believe in God. Do you? What God? What God do you believe in? What, what God? There's only one. You know, and if you're going to believe in God, don't you want to believe in the number one God? The God of gods? The Lord of lords? The one who's the boss? Didn't you want to, you know, when you're in the store and you have a problem, you say, I want to talk to the manager. I don't want to talk to you, you salespeople. I want to talk to somebody who can do something. All right, well, in a small way, that that's... God is God. He's the world's only one. One God. That's the God we believe in. We trust in Him because He's the only God. In first, or uh, yeah, it was uh, First Kings chapter eighteen. Elijah gets all the people of Israel together, and they're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping Yahweh, the God of Israel, and they're worshiping other gods. And and there's just a long list. And he says, guys, guys, and he says this. Elijah came near to the people and said, How long are you limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is, then follow Him. And then right there in between there, it doesn't say this, but it says, Man, make up your mind. Just make up your mind. Because remember, we already know indecision is disastrous. 
but we'll follow God because he is God. There's no other. The last, qu- the last uh, uh, decision you need to make today is I am deciding today that I will trust the Lord no matter the opposition. Because here's the deal. If you decide that today, if you decide right here today, I'm going to decide all these four decisions. I'm going to make them. And by the way, we need to make these four decisions every day. I'm going to do this today. I am going to follow God. I'm going to trust Him in His Word. I'm going to follow God and not my past ways. I'm going to follow Him because He is the only true God who can do anything. He's the only God, and I want to follow that living God. There's going to be opposition. People are going to go, you're a fool. You're a fool. And that's what it says in 1 Corinthians. It says that it's foolishness to the world. People who don't believe, you're a fool. And persecution comes and opposition comes. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12, the, 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 the nation of Israel under the king Jehoshaphat, who loved the Lord, it, there was like four kingdoms coming against them in a big, huge battle. And, you know, they were for sure going to be defeated. They were small. And here's these four kingdoms together, which would just smash them like an ant, like a boot on an ant. And it said, he says this, Our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against the great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but look at this. Our eyes are on you. See, that's a decision. It's a decision to say, look, it it looks like we're going to get a major kick in here. But we're going to stick with you. Uh, I would like to say most of people would run or give up but this is the testimony I'm deciding today that no matter what the opposition no matter how people come up against me no matter if they're going to take away my job or they're going to take away my tax break or they're going to take away this or that or they, no matter what they do to me I'm going to stick with God it is a decision to stay with them And after all, let me just tell you this, going back to the very beginning, that this is a decision of love. That's what love is. Love is a commitment and a decision on a daily basis to do the right thing for the person you love. It's not a feeling. Well, I used to be in love, now I'm not. I used to love God, but you know now, what's God done for me lately? I don't really love him anymore. I believe in him, but I don't... It's a decision. And we need to make these four decisions today and every day. To wake up and make these decisions. Lord, this is your day. I trust you in your word. I trust you in your word. And I trust in you and not my past ways that have never done me any good anyway. So I, I know I want to go back there, but I'm not going to go back. I'm deciding that today. And I'm, I'm deciding today that you are the only true God. And there's no better offer out there. I'm not going to wait for the better offer to come. And even if I have opposition today and it doesn't go my way and the sun doesn't, isn't shining and it's raining or people give me a hard time or all of a sudden I get sick or I can't pay that bill or there's trouble in that relationship, I'm not going to bail on you, Lord. I'm going to stick with you because I believe in you. That is deciding to follow God. You want to decide today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you today.